far in this course, I've tried to present a progression uh, from traditional linguistic equivalence-based approaches. I mentioned the Scopos approach. I've suggested that it suffers from a lack of attention to indeterminacy and is therefore limited. So I gave a talk on indeterminacy in translation. And I stick with that, that in general, there is not one fixed meaning that we translate. The source text is indeterminate. Then I suggested last week that a way forward is to look at what other disciplines do when they handle uncertainty. Uh, and risk management, for me, is the obvious way forward. We start to look at translators' decisions as if they were decisions made in business with the rich panoply of, of mathematical and conceptual armor that we have available for looking at that kind of decision. It's nothing new, it's a logical thing, it's not revolutionary, I think. Now, when I adopt that perspective, I come up against some pretty serious problems of a very practical kind. And one of them, the main one, I think, is this notion of quality. Uh, it's assumed that a translation can be correct or incorrect, but when you think about it, is there absolute perfection? Probably not. Uh, it's a gradation of values. Some are acceptable, some are not acceptable, some could be made acceptable. How do we handle that range? How do we conceptualize it without reference to the ideal of a perfect translation? The essentialist approach would be to say, ah, there is 100% quality, and I'm going to measure how far I am from it. I don't believe that that exists, except in cases of terminology or fixed authorities. Okay, my first lecture was about authorities uh, deciding what is correct or not in translation. So if I abandon that ideal of 100% quality, how can I assess quality? What is it? I hasten to add that the PowerPoint is in German today, but it's my German because I did it too late and my corrector hasn't corrected it. So it's likely to be of inferior quality as an experiment. Okay, uh, Don't laugh, please. I realize that my corrector could revise it it won't be perfect, but it could be better. I wonder, though, if it's good enough for us here today. Probably, yes, it is good enough. What does that mean, good enough? Here's an example. Well, no, no, I want to talk first about how this problem surfaces in actual research. Um, I, I have a research group. We do empirical research. We'd like to find, you know, how women translate differently from men, professionals from novices, young people from old people, things like that, okay? And often in the research project, we have the idea, well, let's see what happens to quality. For example, speed. I make my classes translate and then 30% faster. And we see quality sometimes go down. What is quality, though? How can we assess it? The temptation is for uh, an academic to say, oh, well, I will grade this as if it were an exam, and the exam grade is quality. And that is what's mostly done. Some researchers, though, have given translations to five academics and then five professional revisers from industry in the field concerned. And how do, how do they compare? What's the difference between the way an academic assesses quality and somebody in the profession? Any guesses? Who finds the most errors? The academics, systematically. Especially with interference. With German, you have lots of English invading the language or being accepted into the language. The academics tend to say this is not correct terminology or this syntactic construction is not properly German, uh, whereas people in the field, in industry, are, are far more liberal, far more inclined to accept something as being close enough to be acceptable 
for the industry for this purpose. So who are we academics to say what is quality if the people actually paying for the quality in industry don't care that much? Okay, that's the first problem. The second problem is if you get three academics, they will all give different grades, and three professionals from industry, they'll all give different grades. They find different things. A student of mine did this once. She, she found in the ATA, American Translators Association, certification exams, uh, she found that the graders marked different things as being incorrect, and then all agreed on the global pass-fail ratio. It's as if they all decided intuitively, yes, it's good enough, and then found reasons to justify their decision. We don't know if it happens like that, but when you get into the workings of quality, it's not a stable thing. There's a lot of guesswork, intuition, subjectivity involved in it. For that reason, I'm interested in a discourse on quality. I can't tell you here today what quality is. I won't do that. But I'm interested in the way people talk about what quality is. Perhaps if you're doing some empirical research or you have to write in some way on the quality of translations for your masters, uh, this might concern you and keep you out of trouble. My first example is this. Uh, it's from a conference, actually, when um, a translation teacher used this example about how badly her students translated. Actually, it was interpreting, but my point works the same for written translation. Okay, uh, it's a sort of problem that a written translation can do by Googling it very quickly and you'll get the terminology, right? But this was in conference interpreting, so it wasn't possible to do that. And the, the, teacher, the teacher was upset. I don't know what this is in, in Spanish, which is or French, my languages. Uh, the teacher was upset because the, the translators into Italian, in this case, had rendered it as uh, the Wild West, the land of cowboys and Indians and plants that we know nothing about. <laughs> it's it all bad, bad, bad. This is omission of content, minus two points or something. And I was in the conference, I looked around to an Italian person, what? Well, this is brilliant. This is the most superb translation. I mean, if it's in a conference, you're trying to convey to people how exotic this location is, right? You know, it's not a conference on these plants. It's like cowboys and Indians and all these strange plants. This is brilliant. It, it, it's off the cuff. It's quick. It's efficient. It's easily understood. I mean, if you gave the technical terms, probably half the audience wouldn't recognize them. So I would give that 100% for an elegant solution. The teacher, however, the translation professor, the guardian of linguistic exactitude, uh, decided that that was negative. And this is when I started to get worried about what quality is in the academic discourse, even before we get into industry. And I'm very interested in these kinds of elegant solutions that require not much work and have maximum effect. For me, that's brilliant. For just about everybody else, it's a mistake. I start from the proposition, as does Andrew Chesterman, an English scholar living and working in Finland. Um, I put a link to his lecture online. He gives a lecture on quality and he says, well, quality a translation is good, but good for what? Skopos question. And he says, well, this says quality is always a relation to something. It's not inherent in the text. It's this text in relation to, and there are a series of things that it could be. The first is the start text. The natural reaction is to look over here and say, oh, I've got sagebrush, brush, and tumbleweed over in here, and here I've got ignorance, confession of ignorance. That's not equivalent, therefore points off. But that's only one relation, comparing the two texts. When the text was produced, the start text was not around. Nobody was making that relation. 
That's not the space that quality had to be activated, at least in that particular case. So we could move to the function ah, of the start text, as I did in my analysis. And then I, I said, well, that text there is supposed to make this conference setting sound exotic. That's its function. This translation fulfills that function, therefore it's good. So my notion of quality has changed depending on the relation I'm looking at. Okay, that's very simple. This is Scopos stuff. It doesn't get us any further than that. However, we know that the target text can have a different function in some instances, in which cases we have to know that purpose, which, as I pointed out, is yet another essentialism. But if we can guess at something like that purpose, we could look at the relation to the target text. Christiana Nort makes quite an interesting statement somewhere. She says that an error, which would be an absence of quality, an error is a uh, nicht erfüllung. It's non-compliance with the client's commission or the client's instruction, auftrag, okay, brief commission, instructions, I think I'm happy with in English. When you don't carry out your client's instructions, that is a lack of quality. And this is yet another relation, because the instructions may be quite different from the other things that you have around you. And when you think about it, you're going to get paid because you follow out your client's instructions. And a lack of quality at the end of the day should mean a lack of money, right? So this would be the relation to prioritize, perhaps. In the industry, though, in certification exams, in a lot of the training programs, though, we have an appeal to something quite different, something called best practices. Uh, best practices just means that this is the way it's done by professionals. And if you don't do it in this way, you're not going to achieve professional quality. So uh, we have some best practices, for example, for using or not using translation memory or machine translation, for using technology. Or best practice is to ascertain the client's purpose first and before you start translating. Or when I was being trained, not in translation, but anyway, uh, we were always taught, before you translate, read the whole text first. Best practice, so you know what it's about. And then we discover that professionals don't actually do that. That is not a best practice because nobody has the time to do it. They just get in and start and make sense as, as they go along. Now, best practices is, is an interesting construct for quality because it is entirely essentialist and idealistic. idealistic. It assumes there is this ideal professional who does a professional job, and this professional person is repeated across... 330,000 professionals in the world who all do the same thing because that's what a profession is. It's an interesting assumption that can't be true. However, we do make it. If you go to see your doctor or your dentist and you say, what's wrong with me? You don't want your doctor or dentist to say, well, personally, on the basis of what happened last week, I think that you should do this. No, no, no. You want to know what's really wrong with you and what you really have to do on the assumption that the advice you get is the same for all professionals. It's yet another professional fiction. Uh, that here reappears as some kind of guarantee of quality. This suggests that quality is not so much a thing that people actually measure as a thing that people talk about. It's a construct projected by a certain discourse on the profession. Professionals do this, therefore that is quality, 
So if you get a professional, you will get quality. And this is the way the concept has been displaced in the industry, as I hope to show uh, very soon. Okay? Of course, the other kind of best practice is what I mentioned, the professor, the academic, as expert. However, well, that's also possible. I, I, I make a point that most academics, like myself, are or have been professional translators. Okay, a survey we did of some 300 translation scholars found that I think only 5% of them had not translated professionally. I mean, translate or interpret. Okay? So people like myself do have that experience and are able to talk about what happens in industry. Unfortunately, along the way, something else happens and they seem to get in uh, other cr cr criteria of quality or they did their industrial experience a decade or two ago. And... Uh, industry moves on, new terms come in, new practices come in, and the teaching profession tends to lag behind quite seriously. Yeah, what is quality of the bottom line? Getting paid. Something to think about. And probably other things you could imagine. In the academic discourse of quality, we do find a reference to something called 100% quality, which is this idealistic illusion that I refuse to accept. And it's in a survey done of translation companies, it was carried out by the European Masters in Translation, of which yours is a member, I believe. So you should be closely in touch with this research in the Optimale project. Okay. Uh, the translation companies were asked, when you're employing someone, when you are getting a job, this is for master's graduates, what is most important for the company? 100% quality, ability to translate in one or more highly specialized domains, ability to extract and manage terminology. These were the top ones okay, uh, that were given. And as you can see there, all the companies replied that, well, not all, 62%, I mean, the, win, the one that wins is uh, ability to produce 100% quality. So a lot of students were asking, should I specialize in one or two fields? Uh, the evidence from the companies is it's not that important. Uh, if you can translate accurately from your languages and know your languages very well, that is more important than having specialized field knowledge, and that in turn is more important than being able to do term terminology. That's what the companies are saying. Do you believe that? Is that the way you're going to orient your profession, or should we orient our masters on the basis of this survey? It's what can be done because they then get a list of competencies that should be taught in a master's like this one, and we get, based on the company's replies, which is most important, produce 100% quality, identify client requirements, this would be the Skopos, Auftrag type thing, uh, define or apply quality control, which is interesting, because if you've got 100% quality, you shouldn't need quality control, but there it is. Uh, etc. Okay. Note that experience is uh, fairly in the middle of the list, okay. and that the value of a university degree, can you see it there, is, is down there at 77%. It means that when you go for a job, yeah, it's nice to have a degree, but your, your employer will probably be, probably be looking at these other things even more so. Experience tends to trump a degree. Okay. Now, my problem is, if you ask a company what they produce, and you give them a list of things, and one of those things is 100% quality, 
Could you imagine a language service provider or a translation company saying, oh, no, no, we only give 80% quality, or 75% is good enough for most cases, or we only give 100% when it's really, really important. This discourse is like shooting yourself in the foot if you're selling translations. Why is this? Well, when a company sells translations to a client, I'll talk about this in two weeks' time, the client, by definition, doesn't know what's in that text. Have I mentioned this? That buying a translation is like buying a second-hand car, a used car, sorry, a pre-loved car. You might have done this. You know, you buy the car, it looks great on the outside, it's shiny, but you don't know what's inside that because you're not a mechanic. And you have to buy it on the basis of what it looks like. But the, the quality is an unknown factor. You want a translation into Chinese and you don't know Chinese? It's like buying a car. You don't know what's inside there. Okay? You would like some kind of certification or trustworthiness but absolute knowledge of quality? No. And the person selling the car, what are they going to say? Oh, well, this one's going to break down after 20,000 kilometers, so don't touch that one. And this one over here is going to need a new carburetor in a few... No, they don't have that anymore. Anyway, uh, they're not going to tell you the truth, are they? They would be crazy if they did. Okay? Uh, so... Asking people this question is, is, is it's, it's a tautology. It's not a real question. People were obliged to say, yes, 100% quality, because the discourse of selling this product requires that statement. If you said, which is more important, speed of delivery or quality? Ah, that's an interesting question. Because all the companies will say, Yes, we give you speedy delivery and 100% quality, but then if you ask, well, which is more important? And if it's faster, does quality decrease? You might get a in more interesting modified discourse. Oh, yes, of course, top quality requires a second revision or a third revision, and that may require a week more for a large project. And you begin to see the quality is actually relative. It's a myth circulated by a very facile discourse on the industry and which has been recycled into our image of what we should be producing in our masters. That said, I hasten to add that I think the most important thing for me personally in any master's graduate and master's program is knowing the languages very well. And if that's what 100% quality means, I personally would underline it as being key, a sine qua non. However, they're not quite doing that here. Here, that's dressed up as quality. Let me now look at the relations in turn and to see where they come from and what they're doing in the way we talk about translation. The respect for the star texts may be specific to Western translation theories or translation discourses on, well, on quality. Actually, it went round looking for the bits in the Luther Bible that tell you, thou shalt not add to or take away from the word of the Lord. Oh, don't touch the Bible. Oh, don't put your bit in it. Don't take it out. It's certainly there. Uh, our Western religions tend to be based on the book and the sacred word. And the thing that is there, printed, written, reproduced in the book, and the translations should not add to them or take them away. Which is actually quite interesting, because when I, 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 I searched around to get these passages, uh, lots of people asked the obvious question, hey, how come the Bible, some have more books than others? How come the Catholic Bible isn't the same as the Protestant ones? Uh, what do we do with these added books that are sort of apocryphal? They're there, but they're not there. 
Okay, but the, the fear of changing the text is part of this religious culture that we have inherited, I suggest, and is even more pronounced in Islam and Judaism, religions of the book. Cultures that have not had religions of the book tend to be far freer in their traditional attitudes to translation. Uh, India, the Indian tradition, which has its great epics, but the epics, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavata, are not books. They are collections of stories that are performed and re-performed and adapted and retold in many, many different ways, like the Hindu gods themselves, uh, which, which are reproduced and adapted. So uh, Harish Trivedi, an Indian scholar, uh, argues that before Western colonization, there was nothing in the Indian tradition that corresponds to our concept of translation. Everything was retelling. Anuvad, the Sanskrit word for translation now, actually means to say again, to tell it again. A relation in time, not in space. Übersetzung is spatial. Anuvad is telling it again in time. Continue, adapt, diversify the tradition. A religion of the book has trouble with that. We tend to distinguish between what is translation and what is adaptation, bearbeitung, everything else. So the respect for the source text is apparently entrenched in our cultures and is still there. It's still the way you're, trans you're trained, I suspect. When you have translation classes, you're all looking at the same text, trying to get close to their text. Is that not the case? I wonder why. Of course, if the word of God in the Bible is divine, any translation will be inferior to it, which creates a problem for Christianity. It doesn't create a problem for Judaism or Islam, where translations are mere secondary representations. Hebrew and uh, classical Arabic are perfect, divinely inspired languages, and that solves that problem. Uh, the Christ Christian tradition, though, has long depended on translation. Uh, so when we get to the New Testament, and you get especially to the work of, uh, of Paul, uh, you have this uh, separation between spirit and letter. And the role of the Holy Spirit becomes key because that spirit can justify a translation having a sacred status. Uh, so we find the Septuagint and the uh, Jerome's Vulgate being accorded divinely inspired status because not of the passage from letter to letter, but because of the spirit which animates them. Okay. Christianity accepts that uh, humans can attain perfection by having divine inspiration, and that's your guarantee of quality. It's in the Bible. If you get the modern translations of the Bible, at least in English, I don't know. German has this interesting uh, up, constant updating of Luther, but the uh, English translations tend to be um, by a committee of people, and somewhere introduction, in the introduction you'll find the translators were united in their belief in the divine nature of the Holy Script, or something like that. That between them there was this spiritual coming together. Uh, the Holy Spirit works through the translators to guarantee the quality of the result. Uh, there's something still in there when we talk about function. Isn't function a kind of spiritual thing? You can't touch a function. You can only construct it and believe in it, like faith in the divine. Functionalism needs to be questioned critically, I think, in its essentialism. Uh, there's a bit of the Holy Spirit moving there. However, I digress, that's for another day. The industry these days uh, works a lot with uh, machine translation. More so, well, what's happening, as I'll explain later, machine translation and, and translation memories are coming together, and it's very important 
to judge the quality of machine translations and, and to try different algorithms to raise quality. So in that little bit of the industry work, we have another discourse on quality where the concept of 100% quality actually operates. And the 100% quality in, for example, the Bleu score, bilingual evaluation, is that whatever a human translates is 100% quality. Uh, the aim of the machine is to get to where the human is. And therefore, just by being human, you're 100% quality, which is lovely, isn't it? We've all got it automatically. Uh, but you can understand what they're talking about. They're talking about blatant errors that are miles away from what any right-minded person would do. Okay? The same for the TER score translation error rate. Here, they judge it by estimating what a human would do there, how many changes a human would make to bring this machine translation output to an acceptable human translation level. What's happening here? Well, the difference between machine and human is so great that 100% is an ideological value attached to the human. What's actually happening, of course, is rather like the Turing test. Uh, the Turing test is, is, is to get automatic translations to the point where if you give that translation to a reader and a human translation to the reader, it's not that they're 100% perfect, it's that the reader cannot tell which one's human. Okay, and that's really the aim of machine translation. It's this inability to tell which is machine and which is human uh, that is associated with the 100%. Still though, it sits there in the discourse. The attachment to the source text, however, remains strong. Just in the way we're working, this is a translation memory. What is it? That's deja vu. It doesn't matter these days, they all look the same. Trados will give you the same two columns. You've got your star text on the left, your uh, target text on the right, and you get the matches coming up and the glossary matches. Just the way it's set up, just the way it's designed, just the way the segmentation operates says you will translate to stick to the star text. Uh, so that 100% human quality really means 100% ability to follow the star text. It's quite hard to, you can merge segments and split them, but it requires extra effort. Another thing in the industry is um, a grid for evaluating translations. This comes from LISA, the Localization Industry Standards Association, now defunct, but the, the grid lives on. And this is just the form that you have to fill out the way you're evaluating a translation. And what's interesting in it is, as you might be able to see, that Maximum error points allowed for this text, which has 2,100 two, 21, word, words, 21. You're allowed, 20, you're allowed to make mistakes. In the industry, there is awareness that mistakes happen and a certain number are tolerable because you have to go fast. You have to produce huge numbers of words. However, not each error is at the same level. As you can see here, Perhaps a minor error is one point, a major error is five points, which is a big gap, okay? And then a critical error means you lose all 21 plus one. That is, you fail. So some errors are so critical that you cannot make them or the whole thing goes down the drain. Others are tolerable, one point errors, who cares? Hey, come on, that's just really human. Uh, and in between them, you have the five pointers, which you would not want to make. Uh, in 2,000 words, you can make four of them and get away with it. This is interesting because it's actually used. Uh, it's not used on a whole project. You would sample it. You would take bits and pieces from it and then do that analysis. And it's implicitly functional. Uh, the people who drew this up used the terms 
critical and major, but never say exactly what it means. Critical for what? Major with respect to what? And it must be with respect to the purpose of the translation. It must have that inspiration there, but the industry discourse isn't going to elaborate that in any uh, major way. So there's a certain functionalism there. Um, it's also assumed that the human reviser can pick this up in a, in a mathematical way, that the, the, the necessary intuition is converted into mathematical language. And the important thing is it allows for imperfections. So much for the 100% quality that people answer in their discourse, it's not applied in what's actually done. Finally, well, almost finally, the industry has, has another kind of discourse on quality, and it comes from what I mentioned as being the nature of the profession and the idealization of the professional. Um, here, they realize that it takes too much work to evaluate all the translations. If you get out into industry, you're producing, especially with machine translation and translation memory, you're producing huge quantities of text. Often you're updating prior translations. Nobody can sit down and evaluate all of that. And even just sampling, you know, for every 20,000 words, I'll take 500 and evaluate that. Even that takes too much time and effort. I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, but my university at the moment is going, well, for some years has been trying to tell us that we are a system and we have to be a quality system. What does a quality system do? It controls itself, right? So if you've got a system all the people working in the university, part of that system will be the people who control the quality of what everybody else does. And so if it's 10%, one in 10 is assessing the quality of that, okay, the system can survive quite well. So I have some little bureaucrat there who gets all my courses, I have to do the competence analysis, how many, what skills am I doing, what competencies, how do I evalu evaluate them, etc. I have to do that planning every year, and some bureaucrat goes along, have I done this, yes, have I done this, yes, 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 yes. Therefore, my courses will have quality. Is it rubbish? Of course it's rubbish. You just tick the boxes and then you do what you always did beforehand. Okay, but the system can handle that unless you get up to 40 or 50 percent of the system, which is controlling the rest of the system, and then it's too expensive. The system can't, can no longer function because there are more people controlling its quality than are actually doing the job. And this, is actually, this is where my university is getting to at the moment. There are so many people controlling us, we've forgotten how to teach. Here, happily, you seem to have wonderful lack of control. You know, well, here's some guys, go and teach them. Do something there. Perhaps I speak too early. Okay. Um, all right, so um, quality, in, in that view, becomes not just an ideal to attain, but a cost. If I'm going to get top quality teaching, uh, the system is going to have to allocate a whole lot of its energy into creating that and uh, measuring that and maintaining it. How can we reduce that cost? Sampling translations is far too expensive and subjective. So the industry discourse in quality management systems is to control the process and not the product. Instead of looking at translations, we will look at the way translations are done. So you get these industrial standards, especially uh, 1538, European Quality Management for Language Service Providers, which insists that in a company using this standard, every translation will be revised by the translator and then reviewed by a second professional other than the translator. 
It's assumed that if you have a revision and then a re an external review, the quality will be increased. End of story. It also has some uh, indications or rules about who the translator must be. They should have a degree from a program like this or certain years of experience. Our, our profession is not regulated by degrees. It's regulated really by experience. Forget about the product, too difficult. Control the process. So what do people do? The companies sign up to this, they apply it. The cost of their translations is slightly higher because they do have to pay for a second, re re second revision or a review. And with it, they can offer their customer a certain guarantee of quality. It's like the person you buy that used car from. They can't tell you what's under there. They're probably not a mechanic either, but they can give you this certificate saying that we have carried out these checks, and here is a certificate to prove it. Trust me and trust this bit of paper. Trust that standard. That's the quality. Quality has moved from what's in the actual thing to a signal of trustworthiness, about which I'll have more to say next time. So I hope to have got across these points. The notion of accuracy in our tradition is very much attached to a text, but in actual practice, people are not looking at the text, they're looking at other things. They're making assumptions about the perfection of humans, but in practice, they're recognizing that all of us make mistakes, and that if they're not critical, that's okay. okay? So these articles of faith are all very relative. Um, in practice, they don't talk about functions, but they're assuming functions as soon as they say what's critical or what's high, le high level or high risk. And uh, in practice, they're talking about the quality of translations, but they're not doing that. They're actually trying to control the process because it's cheaper to do it. That's, I think, where our industry discourses of, on translation have got to little by little. This has reached the point where uh, Roberto Beninato, who um, has had various functions, he used he was one of the founders of, of a, a research agency called Common Sense Advisory. Uh, in 2007, he argued that he didn't say quality is a load of rubbish, but he almost said that. He said that no translation company should try to sell quality because the client can't tell. If all the translation companies say they give 100% quality, it's like saying they're translation companies. It's not, it's not a selling point. And the, the client will not be able to distinguish between you. Customers will always expect perfection. We know we can never give it. So what is this confidence trick we're trying to play? Quality doesn't sell, so don't sell on quality. I am citing him. And his recommendation to the companies is that they should differentiate on the service they provide. That is, forget about quality, talk about specialized in certain fields, talk about how fast you could do it, talk about how your process is different, talk about anything else, because nobody even knows what quality is anymore in industry. And this created some storms, but I think, I think he got to an, a grain of truth. I would want to rewrite, I've given you the link there if you don't believe me, I would want to rewrite his, uh, his statements a little in a slightly different way, but I think he's basically correct. I think text-based quality has become too expensive to measure. And that's the real problem. It's not that clients can't tell, but it takes a lot of money to find out. You have to really find a second translator to talk about the first translators. Do you know what they always do? I don't know if this has happened to you. It happened to me once in my 
I had a, I don't, I'm coming back to this. I had a really good... My client was the, the, the local government of Catalonia, the, the Generalitat. God, big paying client. Great. You know, I really work hard to the first translation. You know, I do two, three, I seven revisions. This has got to be good. And what they did to check on me, they gave it to a second translator. Okay? And any translator who, in the market, anyone can find a difference. For example, I said, the current edition, no, I said, the present edition of the book, I had to update a book, okay? And the other guy came along and said, no, no, it shouldn't be present, it should be current. Uh, so right, yeah? And then, I don't know, all the little things. It was obvious he was stealing my client from me. He was finding mistakes that are not real, well, you know, possible variation in English, there's a lot. And he was just going through it, saying, this is a load of rubbish. Don't employ that person. Give, give it to me. Huh. Okay, so I, I went in there with a dictionary. I said, no, look, you can do it. This is before the internet. You can say this. I can say this. It's in my authority had to become a dictionary. Anyway, I won the client. I kept the client. Okay. But this idea of... <clears throat> Measuring quality objectively in industry is very tricky and can lead to some very non-ethical business practices, which I hope you never have to encounter, as I have. Anyway, uh, it's too expensive to measure. For the first time, this client, an important client, did assess me by giving it to another translator. Or if you get a job in especially the United Nations system, the United Nations institutions, as a junior translator, you will have a reviser who will revise what you do for two years and give you feedback until you learn their jargon, their style sheet, exactly the way it's done in the United Nations system. You really learn on the job. That's expensive, but they produce a very high-quality, highly trained translator. Okay? Outside of uh, that, in, in, in the general life, quality, the cost of quality is a problem. Customers will pay to believe in quality, oh, missing an S there, uh, because it's better to believe in it, it's more efficient to believe in it than to actually check it. And so what they're looking for are the signals of quality and not quality itself. I actually, uh, years ago, I wrote a book um, trying to give practical advice, but it was, it was before I got into the discourse of signals of quality, but I did say things like, when you have a big project and you're communicating via email with your client, always go and see them in person so they know who you are. Okay, your personal presence, personal contact will make them remember you and trust you because you look like a person. Somehow people inspire more quality than, than an email address. Okay? And then I said, on days when you have a hangover, always wear a suit and tie. Well, man, I haven't got a hangover today. I've just... <laughs> uh, that appearances do matter. The formatting of the translation shouldn't matter to its quality, but it does matter a hell of a lot. I remember now why I got the client. I was the first translator in Barcelona to have a laser printer. Oh, that. Okay, this is going back, you know. But, oh, laser printer. Yeah. They didn't know what was in it. It just looked good. Yes. Okay, so the, we pr produced... My God, I did this quickly... We produce and sell signals of quality, and part of our personal system should be invested in the signals. They are important. It does matter what you sound like, what you look like, how human you are, how well you communicate with your clients, if not your readers. I don't want to go there.
I'd now like to shift gears a little. That's, that's for the industry. That's, I, I'm going to pick up on that later when I talk about the way the translation industry is working and the way it will work in the future. Uh, I shift then into economic analysis, okay? Um, people working in conference interpreting have attacked this problem in an entirely different way, which I find interesting. The fact that written translation is attached to an industry and we tend to follow what's happening in the industry and make do as best we can. In conference interpreting, the overlap with the training institutions is much greater. And so we have a far keener awareness of what's actually happening there. Uh, Franz Perchacke, you might know as a, a professor at this august institution, um, is one of a number of people, uh, Igor Kurz, I think, the first one, who carried out surveys among conference interpreters to see what they think is most important in conference interpreting. So they're not asking... Hold on. They're not asking the, the clients or the users... Wait a minute. Let's find it here. They're not asking the clients or the users. They're not asking about production, the way it's, uh, the, the uh, interpreter works in the booth. If you get these different kinds of norms, they're actually talking about expectancy norms. What kinds of things do we expect a good interpreter to do? Okay, we might ask the same things. If a translation is good, what kinds of things would we expect it to, be, to, to do? What are the things that are more important or less important? Nobody's asked that question for written translations that I know of. But they have asked it for conference interpreting, and they've got some interesting results. The, here are the values that they put up when they asked the questions. Consistency with the original. We're fixed on the start text. We know that. Okay? The same for them. Completeness of information. They would like that, but they recognize it's not possible in conference interpreting. Something is going to be left out. Logical cohesion. Also rates quite highly. Fluency of delivery is a little further down. Correct grammar, correct terminology, appropriate style right down to having a native accent, which is the least important. Which is interesting. I always felt very good translating out of English, or interpreting out of English, uh, because of my strong English accent when I speak any language. And I thought that was right, because the speaker, usually if, I, if somebody was speaking in English, I would be back there going into French or into Spanish with my strong English accent, I thought, well, that's appropriate, because the speaker's English anyway. Not that I pronounced the accent or made it worse, but still. Okay, so we find that um, in one of the surveys uh, here, 286 subjects, that's quite a lot of people, we get that list of preferences. These are important. So we could rephrase and say, what's important for quality? What is quality? How does it manifest itself? Poof, consistency with the original. Okay right down to native accent. And then uh, Zwischenberger, Perhacker, 2010, 704 subjects, that's huge. Get something slightly different. There are different subjects, though. Uh, the one that's different is completeness of information. I wonder if this happens. Does it not? Okay. Here, completeness of information jumps... Um, uh, right down. So it depends how you define completeness, and that's a problem of how you ask the question or the survey. It's, I think, a technical thing. What interests me is that uh, I had a student do the, exactly the same survey uh, in Brazil. It was just a pilot. She was thinking of doing a doctorate on this, so it's just a pilot. Okay, go and see what happens. And she got completely different results. Logical cohesion, which is number three in Italy, or around Italy, and, and number two for the 704, basically European and North American. In Brazil, uh, logical cohesion goes down to number seven. 
completeness of information goes down to number nine. Okay, and correct terminology is up, but grammar, grammar is good. The one that goes right up to the top is, oh, oh dear, this one here. Fluency of delivery, number one. So, in some countries, fluency is not important at all. It's down at number four or three. But in Brazil, it's up at number one. Okay? And the native accent also moves up considerably on the list. One gets the impression that in Brazil, quality is very different from quality in Europe and North America, which might be the case. Forget about cohesion. Forget about the source text. Just keep the rhythm flowing and make it sound good, like a great samba or a Rio carnival or something. I forgive, I beg forgiveness to all Brazilians. But what was interesting in the survey was the idea that quality may be highly dependent on the culture. It may depend on what's important for a particular culture. How tolerant are you of irregular rhythm, irregular intonation? How tolerant is your culture of foreign accents in your language? Uh, these are very sensitive areas that do change a lot according to where you are.